This is Dan with VGMAcademy.com. I wanted to briefly introduce this interview with composer Ewan Holmstrom from King Digital Entertainment. You may um, know them better as just King.com or King Games, um, but they are the creators of Candy Crush Saga, Candy Crush Shoto Saga, Candy Crush Friend Saga, which is their uh, latest addition to that series, um, and a whole bunch of other really awesome casual games that if you haven't tried yet, you should, um, because they're a lot of fun, but I warn you that they're really hard to put down. Uh, so... It was really interesting to meet with Yoan for a couple of reasons. One is because he uh, is a staff composer, which is something that people really want to aspire to to, to get. Um, and then he's also a composer for casual games um, that are like wildly played on mobile. And I feel like the mobile casual market is something that a lot of people overlook um, and really shoot for that like console experience, AAA, RPG. You know that sort of thing um, but there's just so many people in the world who enjoy games on a casual basis and um, these these games are, are you know maybe not as in-depth as something like a 70-hour RPG but they're you know equally magical in what they are um, and their music is beautiful um, so if you haven't heard any of Yolan's music go listen to Candy Crush um, music, Soda Saga music Candy Crush Friends Saga music Go listen to Pet Rescue Saga music um, and just really enjoy the beautiful writing. Um, and a special thank you to uh, King Digital Entertainment for giving us uh, some time in Yoan's busy schedule to speak with us and answer some questions for aspiring composers. If you find this interview useful, feel free to subscribe as well as share. Um, share online, and, and I really appreciate your time, and I hope you enjoy. Bye. All right, we are here um, with Yoan. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your uh, your schedule to answer some questions for composers uh, because you have such beautiful music and um, your games are are loved. King's games are, are loved by millions of people. So I'm really excited to get the opportunity to speak with you today. So thanks so much for taking some time today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just jump right in so, to sort of like the origin story part. Like how did you end up working for king because there are so many people who like hold like the staff composer job at a at a company as like the pinnacle of what they reach for i'm really inter interested to hear how you ended up where you are yeah so i started freelancing for various uh, companies uh, like uh, i don't know 15 years ago or something and then i believe king was i'd say 8 years ago they started a, an office in my hometown, Malmo, uh, and uh, I read about it. So I, I, I reached out and uh, made contact and they had uh, worked on a game called Pet Rescue Saga. And uh, I started freelancing. Uh, it was actually quite easy. It was like, a, it's not supposed to be that easy, I guess. Because I, mean, I know it's, it's hard to get in, to get like a, a job like that. But I started off like uh, as a freelancer. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, and then we had a dialogue. They wanted to to hire someone, uh, but in Stockholm. But I said I can, you know, commute. Or what do you say? I can go back and forth. Uh, so I, that's how we solved it. And uh, yeah. How did you make that first contact? If you don't mind me asking, did you like to reach out to specific? Like, did you specifically know people who are like working at the company? Did you send in materials? Like, how did that? How did that go about? I just, uh, I, I read about it in uh, the local magazine and it was uh, the name of the, the head of the studio. So yeah. I just, you know, reached out to him. I just found an email, I guess. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I, you know, wrote some of the stuff I've done. Uh, um, I'm quite sure I added some, you know, samples of, you know, how I sound. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was, went very smooth. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. how, how big is the, how big is the sound team over there? Like how many people do you work with, um, over the course of maybe, you know, uh, a, a, within the context of a single game, how, how many, uh, different folks are working on the music and the sound with you? Uh, on a single game, I, normally it's just like one person. We are four composers slash, uh, audio guys, people, uh, and one, uh, audio director. So there's five of us working with audio, but like for on a certain project, the normal thing is just like one of us takes that project. Okay. Uh, uh, occasionally, uh, we work more than one people. Well, actually, it, more than one person. But actually, I mean, sometimes 
uh, we can split things up with sound effects and music. But uh, that's often like later on in the process because when you start off with a new game, you, it's your baby. So you, you think about sound effects and you think about the music and the whole to make that work. Uh, and then as the game progresses, you know, you can start grabbing tickets for, from other games you haven't worked on before and, and, you know, try to add your part. But uh, normally when you start, it's your baby, but once it's out there, once it's online or live, uh, I guess we all help, you know, making new features. Often it's sound effects, but every now and then you need some new music as well. It's nice that you have that, like, team to kind of back you up if, if you need it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's pretty, pretty rare for most people who are freelancing. They, they're, you know, if they want to get that support, they probably have to look at, you know, outsourcing and hiring their own uh, person to come in and sort of back them up. But yeah, and I guess it's way more sensitive because if you're a freelancer, you don't want to lose that gig, right? Right. Yeah. I know someone who can do my job instead. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Not to mention the, not to mention all the privacy <laughs> concerns. Like yeah. you, you'd have to like either have that explicit permission up front or kind of go back to them with your tail between your legs. Like, Hey, actually I'd like to bring on someone else to help me with this one piece. And that's yeah. probably <laughs> super awkward. So yep. Yeah, not a good I, move. Yeah, not a good move. Not a good look. Um, I wanted to talk to you about writing for orchestra because yeah. your orchestral music is so beautiful. Like I, I've always felt like before I get to, I, I, I'm a singer. I'm a classically trained singer, and oh, the cool. rare the occasions where I've been able to perform with an orchestra. Every time I get to like sit near them while they're like just while they're tuning up, it's like I get that like Disney World magical like, yeah, ah, yeah, like yeah. childlike wonder thing, and yes. that you've got that like pumping through your tracks for these games. I mean, it's just it's just a magical, um, beautiful sound that you you get. Um, and I wanted to ask you how you kind of approach orchestral writing because a lot of composers ask me how to approach it because it's just such an overwhelming thing. There are so many instruments that you could or could not use and, um, you know, taking like a piano sketch and then translating it to an orchestra in a studio. Like what, how do you, how do you do that? Like what is, what's your kind of mental approach to, to doing that? Cause I've heard a few, but it's a, it's a big job. Yeah, it is. I'd say my approach is cause I don't have that much training. Uh, I mean, orchestral, I, I, I went to Berkeley, in Boston for a year or so I left because my band back home in Sweden got a record deal so I had to choose and before awesome. that I, w I went to MI in Los Angeles but I never really had any like classical orchestration arranging training so that's I'm kind of self-taught in that uh, aspect uh, but I, I mean I, I listen to a lot of stuff and I easily you know adapt or pick bits and pieces I guess uh, but uh, I'd say it's like almost 100% just like go with the feeling you have by just gut feeling and because I mean I hear this stuff in my head and when I start adding one line I hear another so I just go with that and then one you know and do a mock-up and, and when that's done I I guess I have to you know go through everything and and they can be, you know, clashes, certain uh, instruments here and there, but that's, you know, just take a like close look at what you're doing. I guess that's what orchestration is. Uh, and, and the choice, I mean, the, the instruments you choose, of course, you get the, the sound you want and so on. I'd say it's like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, it's almost like a jazz improvisation sort of when I compose that's cool I don't know I don't know how to explain it well you're not over, it sounds like you're not overthinking it which I think is a big no you know because no. I remember the first time I tried to write something for orchestra I did probably a super rookie mistake where I said I'd love to write something for a video game I'm going to write something for an orchestra because that's what I'm hearing and I loaded up the full orchestral score in Sibelius yeah. and then you know I you know I peed myself a little bit you know because it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. you know and um, I just got so in my head about balancing all those things that I kind of was more focused on all the things and not as much about the song. Yeah, I think you can get like 
which is a good thing, I guess, like there's so much, much respect for the task. If you, you know, you're going to compose for a full symphony orchestra, that's a big thing. And, and I guess some people get like a bit too respectful. If you know what I'm sure. saying. Yeah. Like they're, they're wor really worried about. Yeah. What it's, it's it's, gonna, yeah. 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 So, uh, and I never felt that I've, it's always been like, uh, uh out of pleasure, just like it's a joy working with an orchestra. It's, um, I, I, I think it's fantastic. And, and, uh, but I've never been afraid of doing it. I think that that could be part of it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's probably pretty important because I mean, everyone I've met who is, I've recorded for a few um, game soundtracks and everyone I've met who's been a part of that process is just really grateful to be there because yeah. everyone loves what they're doing. Um, yeah. And things, you know, things come up, things go wrong, things need to be changed. And everyone is usually pretty flexible, not like, you know, crazy stuff, but like everyone's pretty flexible with, with that process because everyone's just really happy to be there. Yeah. Um, but on the I other hand, say, it's like, I gotta say, I'm sorry, but I gotta say it's very important to be surrounded by the right people as well. When I recorded the Can Crush Soda Saga soundtrack, Abbey Road, there's this guy uh, who worked there uh, the engineer, uh, mixer, everything he did, everything. Uh, Jonathan Allen, he's, I think he's won Grammys for um, Le Miserable and uh, a bunch of stuff. He's like major super duper. And he was, uh, that was like the second time I worked with a, an orchestra. The first time was in my hometown. Uh, but I mean, the second time having London Symphony Orchestra at Abro, that's like the <laughs> pinch yourself moment. Yeah. So, but he was like, he was like so nice. And he says, uh, uh, if it's okay, I, I, if I hear anything, because I work with these guys like every week. So if I hear anything, I just tell him to, you know, he could tell it to him straight. So I can just like stand behind him and yeah, what he said. <laughs> and so, uh, no, so that's, that's very important. When I did the Candy Crush Friends recording, I did the, uh, an orchestra in, in New York and uh, the amazing group, Voktave, a vocal group from Orlando. Uh, so when we recorded those two sessions, I had a recording producer called Lars, his name is Lars Nilsson. He has a, a studio in, in Sweden, it's quite legendary. It's Nile, Nilento, uh, it's called, uh, in Gothenburg. And he's, he's, he's like, have his experience working with orchestras is like since, I don't know, 30 years or so. So he's not scared either talking to <laughs> them and because he know what he, it's supposed to sound like. And if, if you're surrounded with people with those skills, it's, it makes your life as a composer way, way better and easier. So that's a great tip. If you want to, you know, see to it, if possible, use other people's experiences as well. If you're in the, like a new situation recording with a, a full symphony orchestra. That's awesome. Hey, actually, I, um, I, I was just thinking that when you were, when you were mentioning um, the, that, that engineer you're just working with, what was his name again? Uh, the uh, Abbey Road? Yes. Uh, Jonathan Allen? Yeah, when you mentioned John I have to Jonathan. D double check. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was just thinking of we have a, the sound engineer that we, we work with over here. She's fantastic. She runs the sessions. She's got this very quiet kind of command of everything. Yeah. And, and she'll, she, she's that, that same you know, translator from the booth to the players yeah. where she can ask for exactly what you need and, and, uh, it's we're always very grateful to be working with her it is i mean the end result could vary so much if you don't you know if you don't know what you're doing and if you don't have that a person in the team who has you know that experience that skill i'm quite sure it w wouldn't sound as good yeah um you know the the other thing i was thinking was that when you're writing for these groups uh, for orchestra, yeah. those recording yeah. sessions are super e expensive. And that's probably another thing that probably freaks people out when you use live musicians every, especially in a recording studio, like a session setting, every minute counts. And I was wondering, are there anything, is there, is there anything that you've picked up along the way that you've um, discovered that it really helps make sure that things go smoothly, like maybe something that you've learned from like your first time doing that experience to now things that you wish you kind of knew during that first time to make sure that, you know, maybe you get the most out of that time or, um, you know, you, 
make things a little bit less stressful for yourself or for others? Yeah, I'd say you got to be like 100% prepared for, you know, the task hand. Uh, I, again, surround yourself with great people. I forgot to mention, I for all the three uh, candy soundtracks I've done, Soda, Jelly, and Friends, Candy Crush Friends, uh, I've used the same conductor. A friend of mine is called Christoph Nubin. And every time I'm done with the music uh, in, in my DAW, I'll just like export uh, MIDI files and he uh, imports it into Sibelius. So right there and then he starts his, you know, the process. It's not like putting a new sheet in front of a conductor for the first time. So I hand over my whole arrangement, orchestration, everything to him. And I say, if, you know, anything feels weird, just let me know and, um, you know, we'll fix that. Uh, and that way I get him involved and he's heard the music before. Uh, so he's prepared more than just like, like I said, uh, the average conductor who just got, but if you just get the notes right there and then, and I'm very prepared. So I, I, I'd say preparation is like the main thing. Like you said, it's not, you know, it's not free. Recording time is not free and many musicians, you know, you, you gotta have respect for all that. So prepare, as much as you know possible before and i mean you can yeah i mean you can always listen I mean, when you look, listen with the in the mock-up uh, in your daw it sounds often sounds like you know depending on how much <laughs> love you've given it, uh, it it can sound awesome or if you know so, certain cases i know oh i'm going to be doing this with a real orchestra so i don't really do all the cc writing with expression and vibrato and so on but uh I've noticed because I'm I don't read uh, music that well. So, but when I heard the stuff in Sibelius for the first time, it sounded. I mean, it sounds horrible. I think compared to if you like in a doll with like real sample libraries, but it, it was like really. Um, it was a good experience because you certainly hear if you've done something wrong in the arrangement uh, or orchestration, you certainly hear it in Sibelius. You sure do. Yeah, it yes. is very unkind. <laughs> yeah, it very is. Unkind. It's yeah. very unkind. Not yeah. very sexy at all. No, it's not. But, but it, but it, it does like bleat those, uh, those mistakes out loud, like, uh, yeah. in a not subtle way. It's, it's yeah. a very <laughs> in your harsh, face. Yeah, very <laughs> harsh sound. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. So that's yeah, funny. That's that's um that's really funny. And it's interesting to hear that you you don't um feel like you ha like you know read um music as well because uh, i think that freaks a lot of people out um themselves because there's so many people that are self-taught uh, yeah. that they go to the technology first and then once you're in the, the DAW, then and you have command over that there's not as much of an incentive or reason for hopping over to a score unless you have to yeah um, so but it's really it's, it's good to know though that you don't necessarily need that if you're especially if you're surrounding yourself with the right people yeah exactly i mean there's um uh, in my world, it's never been a problem at all, actually. It's amazing. Yeah. So I have a question from a one of our from one of the members of our community, and this is about writing music that, uh, like, striking that balance between music that loops and music that is not does not get annoying. How do you approach like writing music that's going to loop without you know while, while still engaging the listener but not keeping it. Uh, or not, not letting it get annoying to the person that was just looping yeah. for 10 minutes. My guess is eventually <laughs> it will be, you know, sort of annoying. I, I mean, so my, what I try to do is like make that stretch as long as possible. I started off when, when the, if you compare like the first Candle Crush game mm -hmm. with uh, the Candle Crush Soda, the first I worked on, Yep. I think it was like 20 second loops on the, on, on the first original and on the music in, in Soda is like three minutes or so. So if you have megabytes enough for music, uh, that's one way to solve it, I guess. Uh, and then I know composing wise, I guess uh, I tried to make like the arrangement there's like always something happening in the background, some, you know, some small sparkling little things, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 
so I, I guess my intention is to if not hear it the first time. Oh, you hear it the second. Oh, there's something new and there's something, you know, so I guess some aspect of layering the arrangement somehow, try to fool <laughs> the listener, if you will. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's my take on it. But I, another thing is, one of the hardest thing I, I think is since we're working with sound effects as well, and a lot of them are like melodic, so you got to stay in the oh, yeah. same key. I cheat sometimes. We all do in the audio team, but it's nothing major. I mean, it's like, but uh, that's like the hardest thing because you want to take the music somewhere else, but no, oh damn, I have the sound effects to, you know, stay true to, stay in the same key. That that's like, uh, yeah. You know what? That's the Bailey's experience in the in the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. the, uh, the clash. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The I was I was always thinking I was thinking the same thing about the especially the Soda Saga game that the arrangement um, for the main playing theme is is such like a beautiful but like really uh, versatile uh, you know piece before it loops. There's so many things and I like all those little flourishes like the flutes yeah. um, going up and down like all that like, kind of little stuff it's really um nothing like super major but like you said it, it did really keep it like kind of like that like wonder that like, little like little piece of magic in there like every now and then that kind of catches your ear but it's not actually the main melodic theme exactly yeah yeah um actually i was just i just remembered um i so my day job is I, I teach music uh, in public schools. And yeah. I, years ago, when that, when that game, um, you know, was uh, first came out, I used it as a teaching exercise. I used the main playing theme as a teaching exercise for reading. Oh, um, soda? Yeah. So, oh. yeah. So, I, yeah, so I, I used it as a sight reading exercise when I was teaching kids how to play the xylophone. Oh. And it was like a lesson in like triple meter as well as like sight reading. Because uh, yeah. it was in the key of F, I think, if I remember correctly. It was in the key of F, and it was... G, G. G? Okay, so it was yeah. G, so one accidental, so I could do it on the xylophone without, like, having to, you know, swap yeah. a bunch of bars out. And um, I had them read it, and, it, like, each day they came in, it was, like, a different piece of the arrangement, and then I'd have them piece it together over the course of, like, a month, and then they had to fit, then I told them that it was from a video game, and then it all of a sudden, like, exploded in their minds, oh. and it was driving them nuts, and then they all, like went home that week to try to figure out which game it was um, ah. because they all agreed like, Oh my gosh, I know, I hear it. I know. Oh my, <laughs> what is it? And then the, the, the next week they came back in, they, uh, they were like, ah, I found it. It's Kenny. So ah, cool. it was a, uh, yeah, it was a really beautiful, uh, really beautiful on or style phones. If you're ever curious, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's just, it just yeah. really speaks to that. Like kind of, it's such a fundamentally, you know, it's not overly complicated music. It's just fundamentally yeah. super sound and super well arranged and super well written that Thank you. it's beautiful against, I always think of like a piece of music that can stand alone on a piano or on a music box yeah. is a really strong piece of music. And Exa well, yeah, the, my, my thoughts exactly. It has to, if you want, I mean, we, if we're talking like uh, tunes that are supposed to be like uh, very melodic and, and, and like that, you should be able to just play it on one instrument and yeah yeah exactly. yeah absolutely so well done thank you <laughs> I guess thank I'll, you I'll lock my long-winded thing that i'm saying um the another uh, another question from someone in the community was um well one person asked how do you get past level uh, 569 um <laughs> but uh i don't you know if they're if they've gone that far they should figure it out for themselves yeah. um one is how do you decide when you a uh, composition is finished and like kind of effectively represents the environment so that you know you can kind of move on to the next phase that was a great question i never thought about it i guess i just feel it done want to go home <laughs> and that, no but not i i i think i've ah oh, i i think i just feel it's done you just know it i never thought about it actually interesting but i'm quite sure it's, it's like you get the feeling you're you're done awesome that's good that's nice i, I think that yeah. a lot of people have a hard time finishing things because they yeah have like bar of quality in their minds you know especially people who are at the start of their careers they're hearing 
music that's implemented in these big successful games and the distance between those places can really get in their heads um and they have a hard time giving themselves permission to like finish and then move on to the next thing yeah so it's interesting that you you it's a kind of the improvisation thing where you're kind of not really in your own head about it which is awesome yep <laughs> i'm blessed that way i guess that's good hey, that's ignorance great. is bliss <laughs> yeah no I, was, I spoke with grant kirkhope a couple of months ago and he he kind of had was the same way he was like i just you know it's it's work i sit down and i do i don't think about it as this big thing it's it's a job and i sit down and i do my job and i i do uh i listen and i do the best i can and that's all you can do, right? Yeah. So um, I've got another question for you. This is a, a little bit of a, an unusual one. Okay. Um, but I'm curious. I always try to ask this question to anyone I speak to because I get a lot of really um, different answers. Yep. So imagine a world where you uh, have to start over um, with just $500 and a laptop. You know everything that you know now, but you don't have any contacts. You don't have any other resources. You just have $500. Uh, and a laptop. How would you start over today if that was all you had to work with? Yeah, I, I, I think like sample libraries. If you, if if we're talking orchestral music, mm-hmm. uh, sample libraries are like really, really important. I mean, that's it's not better than the how good the samples are or not. So, and I know they're, they're quite expensive, some of them, of course, uh, it takes a lot of work to do them, but there are like, I know like Spitfire, some other companies, I guess, have like free stuff you can download, yep. Spitfire Labs, yep. uh, I know, yeah, I'm quite sure some other, yeah, like, yeah, some other brands as well um, that you can get for free, and those I mean, Spitfire sounds amazing. Uh, so I, I really investigate what's out there. And, and of course, there's always like, all of them have like major sales, like Black Friday or Thanksgiving, whatever. Uh, I, you know, try to save my money for that, uh, those dates, I guess, to make, you know, get as much as possible. Uh, I would also, if you want to do other stuff, I mean, it, like pop, rock, whatever, you know, your weapon of choice is, I, I really investigate that you get the best uh, sampler, you know, uh, synth, because uh, it has to sound good. You have to have, you know, good ingredients to work with, so to speak. Sure. That's have- my take. Do you have any any one that you're just really in love with right now? Because I know there's so many that I can't say. Like, uh, what the most sample libraries. Ones. Yeah. I've. I don't, yeah. I currently uh, send samples a lot. I have. I have a lot of sample libraries. Had too many. That's I, that's that's dangerous. You sh- you shouldn't have that many. You should focus more on like working with with one of them and learning every like tiniest bit of that software or you know product and uh, because there are so many options and i have too many i think actually now come to think of it but uh yeah and what i if i go back to your your, the question i'd say uh make sure to build like a good portfolio uh give yourself time in the studio and, and make it sound good do all the if we're talking orchestral, uh, I did do all the like CC writing with, you know, expression vibrato and so on and so on and make it sound like really, really good. Make it stand out. Make like two, three, four or five different styles. Uh, uh, everyone does trailer music, do it, but see if you can do something else. Try to stand out, I guess. Um, yeah, make it, yeah, have a good show reel show. Awesome. And I've got one more for you because I want to be respectful yeah. of your time here. Last question. What is your favorite purchase that you've made that's like $100 or less for your career in, like, from start to finish at any point? It could be something like a book. It could be something like you got a like, really good deal on something. It could be anything. But something that you felt like, wow, I got so much value out of that. And it was relatively very inexpensive. $100? 
Yeah, sure. Sort of. Uh, oh, damn, that was tough. Uh, Jesus, that's hard. <laughs> uh, what's my dog? My whole career, sort of. My whole. <laughs> At any point. I mean, you know, some people like uh, to give a couple of examples. Jason Graves found some like a really cheap violin on like eBay or mm-hmm. Amazon or something like that. And it was like a $99 violin. And, yeah. you know, he's an, I think he's a, a upright bass. He plays upright bass. So like that, it was just like something for him to play with and learn from. Yeah. And that was like his thing. Yeah. I actually bought a very shitty cello the uh, last year. I can't even play it but I can't even start because you can't play it. It's like really cheap and really bad. Uh, but that was uh, something else. I, I know, uh, I, I think I'd say nowadays you can listen to music for free, but I'd say, I guess some album of some great group, band, composer, whatever, performer uh, that have inspired me. Uh, I think that's, that, that, that would be the, my best answer. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for spending this half hour with me to answer some questions. I know that the BGM Academy community is going to get a lot um, of value out of hearing, hearing you. And um, thank you. And we just really appreciate you and your music and King. Um, your games are just so much fun uh, and loved by millions. And uh, I know my household spent a lot of time playing them. So we really uh, appreciate that as well. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey there, thanks for watching this video. If you're a composer uh, of video game music, or you'd like to be, I'd like to invite you to join the VGM Academy community for the 21 Days of VGM Composition Challenge. During this challenge, hundreds of composers come together to make daily composition a habit by writing new music every day for 21 days straight. No excuses. So head on over to vgmacademy.com 21 days, or click the link in this video to learn more and sign up for the next challenge. When you sign up, you'll receive daily emails throughout the challenge with tips and inspiration, as well as a collection of video game themed writing prompts called Composition Quest Logs to help you get the most uh, out of the challenge and to get you outside of your comfort zone so you can generate new musical ideas. This challenge is not for quitters, so if you're serious about writing music for a living, I hope you decide to join us. Good luck.